In this video, we'll talk about the neuromuscular junction. Neuromuscular junction is simply the synapse between the nerve and the muscle. It's a specialized synapse. At the neuromuscular junction, the action potential or stimulation from the nerve terminal reaches the muscle and it would lead to the muscle contraction. The end part of the motor neurons are known as boutons, which basically innervate the muscle. We are looking at one NMJ or one particular synapse. And in this case, the blue is the presynaptic part or the nerve terminal and the orange is the muscle, which is the post synapse in this case. And the junction between them is basically marked by the synaptic cleft where the neurotransmitters would be released. In this case, in, in mammalian situation or in vertebrate neuromuscular junction, the key neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. So these are cholinergic synapses. Acetylcholine is generated from acetyl-CoA with the help of the enzyme acetylcholine acetyltransferase. And from there, acetylcholine is loaded onto synaptic vesicle with the help of vesicular acetylcholine transporter. Once loaded in these vesicle, they would eventually be fused at the nerve terminal when the action potential comes and it would be released in the synaptic cleft. So now we would look at this uh, particular phenomena in a bit more detail. So we would break it down like presynaptic and postsynaptic events and try to understand the nuts and bolts of it. So the nerve terminal uh, is shown in this particular diagram. And you can see the action potential is reaching the nerve terminal. So once the action potential reaches the nerve terminal, it allows the voltage gated calcium channel to be opened. And this leads to severe level of calcium influx into the post synapse. So the extracellular side has calcium in order of, let's say millimolars, whereas the intracellular side generally has calcium in order of nanomolars. So anyway, there is a huge jump of calcium level in the synaptic end. And this calcium leads to the vesicular snare and the target membrane snare fusion by, via a complicated machinery, which I'm not going to talk in a bit more details here. So, and that lead to the vesicle fusion, which allow the neurotransmitter to be released in the synaptic cleft. In this case, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. But here is one thing. When acetylcholine is released in the synaptic cleft, it doesn't stay there forever, right? Otherwise, the overall uh, response would be overwhelming. So in that case, there are enzymes known as acetylcholine esterase that can break down acetylcholine and clear that response. Anyway, these are the presynaptic events. What happens in the postsynapse when the neurotransmitter is present in the synaptic cleft? So let's look at the postsynaptic event. Again, just to give you an idea, the action potential reaches the nerve terminal and stimulates the release of acetylcholine. And here we are zooming into one nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which are nothing but ligand gated ion channel. So as they are ligand gated ion channel, acetylcholine binds into specific ligand binding pocket that leads to a conformational change in these receptor. And the acetylcholine receptor basically opens up and allows cationic influx into the postsynapse. That makes the postsynaptic membrane more positive and there is a voltage change. This is read as a postsynaptic potential change. And these are the postsynaptic event. Now, since we understand the postsynaptic potentials biology, let's look at a little bit about the electrophysiological signatures. So people generally record using sharp electrodes from the muscle. And once they record it, they would see a change in the potential. And this is either there is a change in current or there is a change in potential. The change in current is known as the excitatory postsynaptic current or EPSC. Look at the axis. You can always see picoamps and milliseconds in the axis. So that would give you a sense that this is current. And there could be also excitatory postsynaptic potential. This is a potential change. Let me remind you that postsynaptic potential is not equivalent to action potential. Postsynaptic potential is a graded potential. Now, postsynaptic potential does change the membrane voltage and makes it more positive. And even if it crosses the action potential threshold, there would be an action potential firing. 
Now, uh, in the synaptic cleft, there are a lot of acetylcholine. Now, acetylcholine binds to the uh, acetylcholine receptors, which made the membrane more positive. Now, when there is a, a surge in the voltage, it allows the voltage-gated uh, other channels in the muscle membrane to open. That allows further influx of the cations. Now, eventually, when the voltage reaches the action potential threshold, there would be uh, action potential. In this case, this is not a nerve. So the post synapse doesn't fire an action potential like a nerve, but the response or the readout of the response is contraction of the muscle fiber. That is the postsynaptic response. Now let us understand the same thing using a little bit electrophysiological signatures. Let's say there is a postsynaptic potential which is ha having a magnitude like this, but it is well below the action potential threshold. So action potential is not fired or muscle is not contracted in this case. Even if the second uh, particular PSP is there, it is not crossing the action potential threshold. In a third scenario, there is a stronger stimulus, which leads to a bigger jump, which allowed the action potential threshold to be crossed. And there you can see the action potential is fired, right? Or the muscle is contracted. So this is the overall idea about uh, the postsynaptic potentials. Now let's talk about things that has gone wrong in context of um, neuromuscular junction. One of the disease known as myasthenia gravis, which is a chronic autoimmune disease, and it is characterized by weakness and muscle fatigue. So it occurs when the immune system mistakenly targets the acetylcholine receptors and affect the neuromuscular junction. So here is the control side. Here you, here, here you can see the, uh, uh, the nerve terminal has a quite a lot of release of acetylcholine. Now in the right hand side, you can see the myasthenia gravis where there are specific uh, plasma cells secreting antibodies against the acetylcholine receptor. So first, it hinders with the acetylcholine binding with the receptor. Second of all, these particular antibodies can fix, complement and damage the postsynaptic membrane. That can lead to inflammation and that can lead to a weaker stimulation of the muscle, lead to muscle fatigue and other problems. There is another symptom known as Lambert-Eaton syndrome. In this case, the immune system mistakenly attacks the voltage-gated calcium channel in the nerve cells. So if you remember that the VGCCs that are present in the presynapse are crucial for the vesicle fusion events in the presynaptic uh, terminal. So in the presynaptic terminal, with, when these particular channels are non-functional, there would be a problem in case of the vesicle fusion. That lead to a lesser synaptic uh, release and the overall neurotransmitter level would be less in the synaptic cleft that would lead to a weaker stimulation i mean weaker kind of stimulation and there would be muscle fatigue or less functionality in the muscle now there are specific toxins that can affect the neuromuscular junction here we would take the examples of two or three so in this case the first toxin is botulinum toxin which is derived from the bacteria clostridium botulinum and this botulinum toxin can lead to muscle paralysis. Anyway, this in a specific dose is used for uh, the cosmetic surgery as well. The Botox is very uh, common among the uh, people who are in the glamour world. Now, in this case, in control scenario, we talked about the V-snare and the T-snare, right? The V-snare and the T-snare lead to the vesicle fusion in the presynapse. And that lead to this uh, lead to the neurotransmitter release in the synaptic cleft. Now, botulinum toxin actually breaks the T snare and V snare interaction, and that lead to a faulty fusion of the ve uh, particular vesicles. Now, toxins that can affect neuromuscular junctions could be diverse. There is another toxin known as Bangaro toxin. This is derived from a snake. And this snake toxin also affect the neuromuscular junction, lead to muscle paralysis, but in a different way. In this case, bangarotoxin uh, binds with the acetylcholine receptor and prevents the acetylcholine uh, to be bound with the receptor. That means not too much cation can be influxed through these acetylcholine receptor, even if there is a muscle, uh, nerve stimulation. This lead to a muscle paralysis. So this is how we can understand that there are different toxins which can act in different mechanisms to regulate the functionality of the neuromuscular junction. That pretty much summarizes this video on neuromuscular junction. This is just an overview, but in other subsequent videos, we would be delving into details about the neuromuscular junction. So let's get notes and flashcards 
for your preparation. You can get it from Facebook page or my Instagram page. The links are provided in the description. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook or Instagram. You can support our channel using Super Thanks, which is a heart shape uh, icon with a dollar in it. It's, it's present in the right hand side bottom corner of any video. You can contribute using Paytm, PayPal, UPI or anything. Also, you can support us in Patreon. You can follow our channel, also the Nerd Medic channel, which has exclusive medical contents. So see you in the next video.